Good morning. My name is Andy Charnstrom, and I'm the senior pastor here at Union Chapel Indy, located just west of Keystone at the Crossing on the north side of Indianapolis. On behalf of a wonderful congregation, I welcome you and I invite you to stay around as we worship this morning. I also invite you to come when, when the governor gives us the all clear, to come and visit with us at Union Chapel Indy. We're a congregation of, of some wonderful, broken, uh, awesome, kind, gentle, and yet flawed people. Sort of a merry band of misfits. And if you think that sounds like your kind of people and your kind of place, please come and, and see. There's a lot of anxiety out there. Worry about illness, worry about jobs, worry about loved ones and their possibly being ill, worry about a volatile economy. And we could worry ourselves into a frenzy very easily. But let's take this time together to set worry aside. Let's worship together. It's the Lenten season. It's the, the time for us to prepare. And in fact, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, as unbelievable as that is. And I urge you to join in again then and again on Maundy Thursday and on Easter Sunday to worship God and to be with us. Life has gone on and it will here at Union Chapel Indy. The office is open daily and many of our friends who come to meet here at Union Chapel are still coming and holding meetings. Construction of our new entryway and our new gathering space and our new children's activity center is well underway and it's going like gangbusters. And the garden beds look like they're almost ready for planting. The grass is turning green and the new prairie grasses that were put in last year are waking up and the pollinator garden is almost ready to pop. Now as and because life goes on, I need to ask for your help with something. We can't pass an offering plate today. In fact, I understand that the, the churches that are sort of defying orders and going ahead and meeting aren't passing offering plates there. But our costs and our needs and, and your need to return a portion of what God has blessed you with to God, those go on either way. And so I ask you either to open the church app on your phone or other device, to go to the church website or to dust off the checkbook and to mail a check to us here at 2720 East 86th Street, Indianapolis 46240. And please, please feel good about it as you do. Before we share the message for today, let's Let's take a moment and bow in prayer. God of grace, God of glory, God of the peaceful waters and of the stormy seas, we turn to you today as our refuge and our redeemer. We honor you and we praise you even in the midst of the storm, even as we fear and worry and seek solutions that please us. So speak to us today, we pray. Stop us in our tracks and remind us, be still and know that I am God. And so let us fall still and silent at your feet. God, ease our fears. Quiet the voices that call from our racing minds. Lead us beside still waters. Restore our souls. Engage us in the work that needs so desperately to be done. Send us, virtually if necessary, into the homes and the hearts of our neighbors, carrying hearty supplies of love and mercy, grace and compassion, hope and joy and peace, and most of all, love. Use us to help others. Send us to carry the burdens of our beloved and, and of perfect strangers alike. Let us find our respite in service to others of your children. And let us not forget that we are not alone in this world, whether in easy times or in the times that test us. Let our hearts break for those who need you now. Let the word of your promises, the great yes, flow from our lips as sweet as honey, as rich as chocolate, as easy as the still waters of justice and peace. 
Give us courage to give and give and then to give some more until we are indebted and, and wanting to give yet more. And then replenish us, resupply us, restore us so that we may do it all again. God, use this, your church, Union Chapel Indy, as a centerpiece of the mission of Jesus, as a place where people come, as a place from which we are launched into the world, as a home for those who are lost, and as a reminder that you have said over and over and again and again, and still and always, yes. Let us be your light, your salt, your word to this waiting world. God, hear us as we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our message today is, is a little heavy on scripture. I think, though, that you'll find it to be very meaningful scripture. And so bear with me, listen to it, and, and take it in as best you can. First, from Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. And then from chapter 1 of Luke, a familiar story that may seem out of time to you, but you'll see. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. And finally, just a short clip from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For in him, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, 
It is through him that we say the amen to the glory of God. I love the scientific explanation of creation. It starts, as it must, with the understanding that once upon a time there was nothing. No stars, no planets, no plants, no animals, not even a mosquito or a spider or a snake. No people, no rivers, no oceans or trees, nothing. A big bang. An explosion erupting through space and time, creating space and time, and somehow creating even life. The only question really is, who lit the fuse? I don't have any trouble with that question. It was God who did not light the fuse by accident any more than the entire process was accidental. The reason that I love the scientific explanation of creation isn't that I like to think about things blowing up or being thrown or formed into spheroids that end up rotating and revolving and resembling systems. What I like is this. I like the evidence that it is ongoing. The Hubble telescope and the probes and the explorers, they have combined to tell us that creation continues. The evidence of the explosion is that the formation of what is continues into the distance, into the what will be. Why do I care about explosions occurring millions and billions of light years away? Because they assure me that the creation continues. And if creation continues, then I am assured that God is still involved with what God created with us. You see, God said yes hundreds of millions of years ago as the fuse was lit, and God still says yes today. The Hebrew people looked up in wonder, as we do too, today. But they had no telescopes, no space probes. Exploration for them was by land or by sea, and if on sea, by ships that dared not wander far for the certainty that they would tumble off the edge of the flat earth and be lost forever. And still they looked up in wonder, and they cried out, Lord, hear my voice. And they prayed, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. And in moments of deepest darkness, still they looked up, still their attention to the presence of God, even if they believed that creation was a, a one-step, seven-day moment in time. And we now know they didn't really believe that, but still their attentiveness to God left them saying, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, look to the Lord with hope. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities goodness and mercy. The psalmist was certain of them. God would redeem Israel, not from those on the outside who, who threatened to break in and to plunder, but from its own iniquities. The sins of the people, the sins of the nation would be forgiven. Righteousness would be rewarded. God would come. A perfect combination of powerful mind and remarkable love unconditional, unshakable love. Goodness and mercy. That's our theme this Lenten season. Can you believe that this is the fifth Sunday of Lent and that next Sunday will be Palm Sunday? It is a time to prepare, a time that Sister Joan Chittister described this way when she wrote, Lent is about becoming, doing, and changing whatever it is that is blocking the fullness of life in us right now. The Hebrew people had a strong inkling of what was, what was blocking the fullness of their lives, and so they looked to God. 
and they believed in God's promises. Shall we do the same in this season of Lent? We move from the psalm to the singular greatest event in the history of the world. It is creation plus. Creation and, and then some. It marks the change in the course of human events that, that marked its own place in time thousands of years ago and yet continues to change everything. It began in the beginning and it goes on without end. It is the key to eternity. It is the path that leads to life. And it begins with a young girl expecting nothing, only waiting to be betrothed and married and bound to the man who had been chosen for her. But God had a different plan for Mary. The God to whom the people looked for redemption, the one from whom they prayed that love would come, God was ready to respond. Remember the movement of God from disappointed creator of Adam and Eve who could not obey to angry interrogator of Cain, where is your brother? To the discouraged destroyer of the earth, except that Noah appeared to be too righteous to be unforgiven. To the calling of Abraham and, and the twin offers of faithfulness and friendship. And then to the calling of Moses, who would lead the chosen people, the bickering disobedient, insolent chosen people through a wilderness for 40 years, only then to be told that he, he, Moses, could not enter into the promised land. The people carried with them as they crossed into Canaan those promises of faithfulness and, and friendship. And yet in uncertain times, which for them became the norm, they turned out to be near, neither friendly nor faithful to God. And so they prayed for one who would come to redeem them. Well, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to visit Mary in her room. His offer, God's request, beyond all reason, beyond her capacity to understand, it was no small price that was asked of Mary, still a young girl. No small price, but a lifetime. A devotion, a faith, a willingness to bear and do and follow and lose and grieve and hope. Not in the man that she was to marry, but in God. She was asked to sign an unlimited promissory note, a blank check, a contract that had no foreseeable end. Listen to the words. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Let it be with me according to your word. That's what Mary said. Let it be with me according to your word. It was the big yes. God's plan. God's movement is going forward. The Redeemer's path is made clear. Mary the unlikely. Mary the unlikely becomes Mary the certainty. Who knows what she was thinking? What she was feeling in that moment? Who knows why she agreed? Perhaps it's as our old friend Debbie Thomas suggests. Mary's yes didn't signal the end of the mystery. Mystery had only begun. We have no way of knowing what Mary knew. My guess is that like us, she knew just enough to get started. My guess is that the work of bearing God into the world involved ceaseless discovery and ongoing consent just as it does today. My guess is that each trembling yes Mary whispered into God's heart changed the world as does ours.
Well, what we know is this. Mary said yes, and because of that, life on earth was changed forever and is in the ongoing process of creation forever changing, forever and ever. And Paul, the apostle, takes the story from here. He writes of Jesus, the one whom he never met except in the fog of a dream. And he tells the Corinthians, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For in him every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason it is through him that we say the amen to the glory of God. Saying yes is a commitment to pay the price of what is asked, to perform again and again, no matter what the cost. God was the first to say yes. Noah said yes. Abram and Sarai said yes. Moses too said yes. Mary said yes, and Jesus. Jesus said, and today Jesus still says, yes. In Jesus, every one of God's promises is a yes. We are loved even when times are hard. We are redeemed no matter how deeply we have dived into sin. We are made whole no matter how broken. We are brought together no matter how far apart we have drifted. We are constantly reminded if we are attentive, if we are listening. We are constantly reminded of God's great yes through the love of Jesus. And so when Sister Joan Chittister said, Lent is about becoming, doing, and changing whatever it is that is blocking the fullness of life in us right now, she was urging us to look into our own lives and to discover, discern, determine what it is that blocks us from living lives that are full, full of love, full of hope, full of joy, full of faith. Creation is God's ongoing process of love for us, the ones whom God created. And God's expectation of us is to do and to go and to stand in the process of God's will for the world. God's expectation of us is to do and to go and to stand in the process of God's will for the world because the world cries out today as in the time of the psalmist, Lord, hear my voice. And so let us also speak the great yes to life. Let us promise even while the mystery surrounds us. Let us promise to pay whatever price, time and again, as long as God calls us, that God's promises might be fulfilled, made into yeses, every one, every time, now and ever. So let it be. Amen and amen. This week, as the word no seems to surround us, as it seeps from the pores of the troubled flesh and, and as it bursts forth from the mouths of those who do not know the light, let us be God's great yes to the world. Let the barriers of negativity fall and let the fear of the unknown disperse as darkness at dawn. The grace, the mercy, the joy, and the hope and the love and truly the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.